I've never read this poem before. Um, it's from a book that I wrote that never saw the light of day, mainly because I didn't want to go to jail. So if there's anybody from the Mossad or the MI6 or MI5, just take the next three minutes off. Um, two years ago, I spoke at the UN. I, I gave a speech at the UN around this time on the Day of the Solidarity with the Palestinian people and watching how the UN and the ICC and all of these places have been operating, um, you are reminded of how fucking useless they are. So, it's okay. Thank you, appreciate that. Um, so I, I wrote this poem about speaking uh, at the UN and I'm very interested to see how the interpreter is gonna interpret the very first line. <laughs> Coked up, coked up at the UN. <laughs> today's, today's date, some, deca some decade of a long-winded articulation. Outside the building, the Israeli ambassador protests me with a billboard truck. I wasn't surprised by the bloodstained sinks in the bathroom or the chameleons or around. By the fifth time I've shown my security guards my passport, I felt like a natural threat. I asked to speak where president spoke. No suit, no pleasantries. Yes, it's politics and optics, but mostly I have class after this and a disappointed professor. No time for ironing fabrics or theatrics, only fleeting handshakes, only poems overdue. I will go next. Now, there's a, there's a toddler on the podium, gesturing at his limbs, auctioning his humanity. A state rep weeps, another masturbates. For the speech, I watch Kwame Ture. For the paper, I write the same article in advance. Century-old talking points, their timeliness frightening, the ransacking, not routine, relentless. This morning, genocide continues between the river and the sea. Vocabulary is not genocidal. Annihilation is. Power imbalance. David against Goliath, not Muhammad against Moses. One nation under surveillance, another in psychosis. David against Goliath, not Muhammad against Moses. One nation under surveillance, another in psychosis. I... I almost, I almost dove headfirst from stage into an orgy of diplomats. Hello, good morning, jab after jab. I have contempt for this council and most damning of all, contempt for the nerve. They will only ever stop the circle jerk when precincts erupt in flames. I broke a limb and the headlines I've apparently left a knife at the scene and the politicians in red noses. On television, the pundit accolade me with adjectives, but my mother is not proud. She wishes I brushed my hair. I haplessly looked for bruises in the status quo as the, dry, as the taxi drove away. I haplessly looked for bruises in the status quo as the taxi drove away. Many phone calls and thank, and thank yous, but I am ungrateful and late to class. I deafen my ears to the applause. One cannot lead without stomping, betraying the skeletons in his path. I sit elbow to the table, humble ambitions. Outside the window, a great big world, and I want none of it. Thank you. Thanks. Um, I want to talk to you a little bit about Gaza. Um, on October 13th, there was a photojournalist named Ali Jadallah, and he was um, recording himself as he was driving his car. And he was talking to us, his viewers, and then he moved his window to the back seat, and he showed us the lifeless body of his father. And he said, there's no ambulances in the Gaza Strip. I'm paraphrasing. He says, we have gotten to a cat catastrophic level. I'm going to bury my father by myself. There are no ambulances or people to help in the burial. He says, and then he asks us for prayers in an impromptu eulogy. The next day, Ali Jadallah gave an interview to a TV channel, and he described how he was at the, at, uh, at, on the job on Al Shifa Hospital, uh, working when he first the news when we when he first the news when he first heard the news that his house was bombed, and. 
All of his family was under the debris. And after hours of sifting through debris, his mother, wounded and fractured as she was, was the only one pulled alive. The corpses of his three brothers were retrieved by the evening, but his father and sister were nowhere to be found. Jadallah spoke to the TV presenter about how the driver of the bulldozer leading the rescue mission announced that he had to go save others. Just a few streets over, there was another building that collapsed, and the driver of the, of the bulldozer suspected that there were 70 people still alive. So he told Ali that he has to go. And Ali said, of course, you must go retrieve the living. There are priorities. This, is, this all happened um, while Ali was on the job and immediately after. He went, to give a, he went to give an interview about it. And there are many such cases of Palestinians stuck in the wreck. Many such cases of people grieving on the job, killed on the job, and others struggling to fit 30 or 40 or 80 members of their family in the same obituary. Jadallah's family are some of the tens of thousands of Palestinians who have been killed by Israeli airstrikes on the besieged Gaza Strip since October 7, the date when many bystanders seem to have introduced Gaza to their vocabulary. A lot of people have been talking about Gaza. Most of these people are writing their essays and articles on expensive couches and expensive houses next to windows not blistered by white phosphorus. Their chandeliers never shake to announce a building's final throws, nor do these writers ever sharpie their children's names on their arms in case of unexpected rubble. Such details are not minor. Even outside of that spectacular violence, the mundane in Gaza is still lethal. Even during ceasefire, life in Gaza is abject. Most of those writing about Gaza are not doing it in internet cafes crowded with young men and their aborted potentials, or from bedrooms haunted by suicide. That too isn't a minor factor. What I'm trying to say is that there are no soapboxes in the concentration camp. We simply do not understand the consequences. We simply do not understand what life inside Gaza does to a person, what violence that violence begets. We do not know the consequences, the mental and muscular consequences of transforming a cab into a hearse to deliver a loved one, now dead in a body bag. Which man, which man will the boy carrying his brother's limbs in a backpack grow up to be? And where do we get the right to condemn him? What, what becomes of the nurse whose shift is interrupted by her husband's corpse on a stretcher? What about the father carrying the remains of his son in two separate bags? What happens to them after all of this death, once they are alone and away from the cameras? We know, we know the facts about the Gaza Strip, right? We know that it's uninhabitable, as been declared by the useless UN, and it's under siege, and that two-thirds of the population in Gaza are um, this, uh, refugees, descendants of refugees who had been dispossessed during the creation of the Jewish state. We know that half of the population in Gaza is children. Um, many of them have had their calendars marked by bombardment after bombardment. Sometimes we use these facts um, to contextualize and historicize uh, the violence coming out of Gaza, but more often these facts are obfuscated to dep depoliticize and mystify that violence. But neither we nor our enemies really contend materially with those facts and figures. We recite the numbers as though they are the weather. We spit out the word uninhabitable without really reconciling the fact that Gaza is a place like no other. Here is a strip of land encircled by an abundance that it is owed. Yet people there live in scarcity, live deprived of water and food and passage. Boys in such a world are men, and girls are men, and the women are men too. Not only men, but fighters, who all seem, through a sniper's eye view, to be plotting a second holocaust. 
Everyone in Gaza is a potential terrorist and thus a legitimate target. Words like agony and brutality are inept here. There is no comprehending this. I live in Jerusalem. Well, half of the year, Yanni, don't tell. Don't tell the government. Um, but I live in Jerusalem. I grew up in Jerusalem. And if we measure only by distance, my home is only an hour away from Gaza. But because of the blockade, Gaza appears as though it is a faraway planet, foreign even to neighboring Palestinians. The deliberate and systemic isolation of the Strip has translated into a cyclically vapid understanding of its reality, particularly in the media industry. The industry standard is to dehumanize Palestinians. Our grief is negligible. Our rage is unwarranted. Our death is so quotidian that journalists report it as though they're reporting the weather. Cloudy skies, light showers, and 3,000 Palestinians dead in the past 10 days. And much like the weather, only God is responsible. Not armed settlers, not targeted drone strikes. Producers invite us, it seems, not to interview us for our experiences or analysis or the context we can provide, but to interrogate us. They test our answers against their viewers' biases, a bias well-fed through years of Islamophobia and anti-Palestinian rhetoric. The bombs raining down on the besieged Gaza Strip become secondary, if not entirely irrelevant, to our televised trials. Um, there's a there's a there's a Egyptian political prisoner named Ala Abdel Fattah. <laughs> you know me and my uh, me and my friend um, Aman used to have this fight all the time. He writes in his book. He says, if I were free in Gaza, instead of locked up in Cairo, I would read books, walk on the beach, work, and make a living. And make a living. And I would always joke about this passage because I say you cannot you know, romanticize siege. Um, his sentiment is undeniably dignifying and even beautiful. He says, Gaza is besieged, but it has not been taken captive. And the difference is enormous. Still, myself, I posit these words. Can one gloss over a sky blocked by barbed wire? What is that if not captivity? You know, I've, I've heard it said, and I said it myself, that those confined by siege or incarceration can be, can be emancipated in the mind. To dig a tunnel out of prison, one must first imagine it before clawing at the floor. So perhaps Palestine taught Allah what it has taught many of us, that here the symbolic meaning of military barriers does not extend beyond the material fact of their cement. But what Allah lionizes about Palestinians in Gaza is what he has in common with them. The rejection of foisted realities. The refusal to die in the wait. To end, I just want to speak about a person, a dear friend of mine, but really an authority figure who also refused to um, die in the wait. A lot of people here talked about him today. Rifat al Last. Last I heard, Rifat was still under the rubble. You know, such a sentence should not be meant literally, but there is no metaphor or hyperbole here. There is no poetry in this sentence. Rifat is still under the rubble and he isn't alone in this suffocation. Thousands in Gaza remain buried in debris, but airplanes still take flight People still travel, and what's worst is that the birds still migrate. I checked this morning. I'm told it's blasphemous to ask why God has yet to show face, but it's hard to keep a faith that hasn't kept my people. Rifat is still under the rubble, and I don't think I understand the heft, the heft of such a sentence. They say there are seven stages of grief, and Thus far, they have all, all seven of them have been disbelief. 
If I stand here and read an obituary, if I told you that Rifat al arair was a poet and professor born in 79 from Ghazi Shuja'iyya who earned his BA in English from the Islamic University of Gaza, which by the way was completely destroyed by Israeli airstrikes, and his masters from UCL here in London, which by the way has refused to comment on his assassination. And he also, it looks like you're booing me, I'm kidding. Um, no, Boo is right. He also earned his PhD and co-founded We Are Not Numbers and co-edited Gaza Writes Back and, 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 and was one of the few sending us fragments of news and analysis despite the media blackout and, and, and. If I stand here and read an obituary, if I decorate this eulogy with kind words, with the kind of shiny adjectives we only gift our friends after they have died, I would be doing us all a disservice. After all, this is a man that loved to cuss and joke. Even when the bombs dropped, he gave us laughter and perhaps indulged me, especially as the bombs dropped, he gave us laughter. So I'm not going to indulge in meaningless good taste because he gave us laughter, thunderous laughter, when the world ordered us to shrink and whisper. When Israeli propagandists made a ridiculous claim that Palestinian fighters had baked a baby in the oven, um, which, by the way, the Israeli military has denied itself, since many of you will love to hear it from the horse's mouth. Um, Rifat joked on Twitter and he said, with or without baking powder. <laughs> um, and many, many people use that against him as some kind of indictment, but to me that is so courageous and so funny and so human to be able <laughs> to be able to be able to joke in the face of so much insidiousness. I mean, the claim made about baking a baby in the oven is so insidious because it invoked a real crime that took place during the Deir Yassin massacre. It replicated, it replicated the testimonies of eyewitnesses who saw Zionist soldiers throw a father and his son in an oven. What do you do with so much insidiousness? Rifat satirized it. I also don't want to sit here and draw a perfect victim portrait because perfect victims are boring and impossible. And Rifat was so courageous and funny and interesting and full of humanity. And when we try to conjure up perfect victims, we are shrinking the scope of humanity for everybody around us. When we try to dictate who is and who isn't mournable, who can we and who can't we grieve with when we emphasize the death of women and children as though the death of our men is not heartbreaking. <laughs> we are shrinking the scope of humanity for everybody else. So to leave you, I just want to invite everybody in this room to be a little bit more courageous, to be a little bit more human, to be a little bit more flawed, to satirize and ridicule and make fun because it's, there is nothing more precious than laughter. And we can't let this storm pass us by. We can't just be bystanders in this genocide. We all have an active role to play. Right there, over there, they are subjected to a genocide, but here we are at war and each of us has an active role to play. Thank you so much.